ओम शांति वी हैड ए मीटिंग बिफोर अबाउट टू डेज एंड इन द मीटिंग दादी जान की सर सडनली आस मी रमेश वाई डोंट यू टेक क्लासेस फॉर दिस डबल फॉरनर्स आई सेड आई डोंट नो वाई आई एम नॉट टेकिंग क्लासेस I think they think that maybe I may be in their opinion I may be very busy or I don't know what is what it is, but fact is that I am not that easily invited. So Dadi said okay, and then Dadi had a discussion with Sister Silu, and then Sister Silu telephoned me, said will you come here and take class? I said I don't mind. Then suddenly she asked me the topic. I said, "You suggest me the topic because you know that you see, once what happened that I was introducing Usha, my lucky wife, you see, to somebody, a friend of mine, and I told my friend that Usha can speak on any subject for two hours. So he said, 'What is there in it?'" my wife can speak without any topic for 4 hours <laughs> so from that day i have decided that there should be some topic then only what will happen that there will be some meaningful and useful discussion and therefore when she asked me i said you give me time or you suggest me your topic because i don't mind speaking on any subjects at which may be suggested by you then she insisted that no ramesh bhai you give your topic then i was thinking to write this month's my article you know i normally write one article per month for our hindi gyanamrut <coughs> and i was thinking of writing this month's article on this subject of women's empowerment because that's a topic which is very relevant uh, not outside india but at least in india because at the moment parliament of india is concerned about the question of reservation reservation of certain seats in the parliament of india and we have got two houses just as in england also house of common and house of lords here also we have got two houses upper house and lower house and they are already accepted this principle of reservation 33% reservation for women in our parliament so they think that empowerment of women means reserving certain seats for women in the parliament and therefore thereby you see they will be empowering or emancipating also women of india that is their political strategy if you want i can give you statistics of the world also that there are still 20 countries of the world in which there is no reservation for women there is still a country in the world where women does not have right to vote also But there are other countries also where there is a reservation also reservation of seats for par- in parliament for women there is a country in which there is not only reservation but there is a compulsory se- se- selection of women and if and if that number is not there then the parliament will not be treated as duly constituted that much rights so to say they are given to women and they think that that is the political emancipation or politi- political empowerment of these women in india you see this is this topic of reservation is very 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 relevant because 
In India, there are so many varieties of communities. And the government, there was one minister, he introduced the subject of reservation in the parliament, a reservation in the jobs and everywhere, you see, for people be belonging to backward communities and whatnot. So much so that reservation, you see, they started reserving that ultimately a day came when they had 67% reservation of quota of seats in colleges, in jobs and everywhere for the people belonging to the backward community and all those things. In the beginning, this reservation was based mainly on the basis of economic situation of, of the person, low caste or backward community, BC and OBC, like that. These are, all those things are there. You may not be properly, you may not be interested to, un, to understand these things. The worst, then the government started reservation on the strength of the religious communities also. And Andhra Pradesh, Hyderabad, you see, that was the first state that they declared reservation for Muslim in the jobs, in the colleges, everywhere, you see, four percent reservation for Muslim belonging to various, uh, to Muslims only. Because when the uh, High Court of Andhra Pradesh invited public opinion on this subject, they invited religious leaders from the Muslim community and they asked them, are there any distinctions of caste and communities in Muslim religion? And they all declared that it is not there. In Muslims, all of them are either Muslims or non-Muslims. There is nothing like caste. In India, in Hindus, there are those castes of Brahmins, then a warrior community and then business community and all those things, these distinct various, there are so many distinct, distinguished, so to say, groups, castes and communities and what not, de depending on different occupations, different cultures and all those things. And it was so tight, watertight, that people belonging to one community cannot mix with people belonging to other community. It was really a big, 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 big problem in India. And in, out of that, suddenly in this case of Muslims in India, you see, they declared reservation, 4% reservation. Why I'm giving you this background so that you can understand this question of reservation and empowerment of the people belonging to different communities. And in that light, you can think of empowerment of women in India, you see, was the political empowerment. And then what happened in Andhra Pradesh High Court, they had constituted a bench of seven judges to discuss and to study, and to declare whether this reservation, 4% reservation for Muslim community is constitutional or not. And our, our divine brother, Justice Ishwariya, he was also a member of this committee or uh, of bench of seven judges and then five, five judges decided that this reservation of Muslims is illegal and therefore this uh, announcement of the government is unconstitutional. Against that judgment, the government of Andhra Pradesh went into appeal before Supreme Court and last week only the Supreme Court decided that this reservation is in favor of Muslims is not based on religion, but reservation is based on the backward and poor people of Muslim communities in India. And therefore it is valid. To what extent it is valid? Again, the Supreme Court has left it open and said that there will be a separate bench of the Supreme Court of India discussing this subject of constitutional validity of reservation of seats in assembly for Muslims only. So it is a debatable question. Same thing is happening regarding this 
uh, right of women or reservation for women in the Parliament of India. Upper house has already passed, but the lower house, they are facing this problem. Because again, there, there are disputes. Reservation, uh, reservation for women out of that reservation, which they have 33 percent against them, against that reservation, they want to have a reservation for Muslim women. A reservation for this community, that community, and all those things. So they want sub reservations, and like that, we don't know what will happen. It's a real tragic thing in India about this reservation, because in case of institutions, educational institutions, they have reserved certain seats for people belonging to a certain community, and if those seats are not full, fully filled in by suitable candidate, then that quota can be carried forward to next year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. And a date might come when 100% reservation will be only in favor of these uh, reserved communities only. So like that, it's a very, very tough political debate going on in India. In that background, we have to study um, this women's empowerment as suggested by Baba. You must be knowing, as I have said to you, the reservation for women in the parliament in India, 33 percent. Like that in our divine constitution also, there is a reservation, 100 percent reservation, that the administrative head of this institution will always be a woman. So, their government is thinking only of 33 percent reservation, but in India, in our divine constitution, in our this divine family, uh, the head of the institution will always be a woman. So, it will be always a women administ administered institution. So, it's a 100 percent reservation in our case. And compared to that, you see, so we brothers, you see, will not have that chance to become administrative heads of this institution. And there is a provision in the Divine Constitution, I don't know if you have read this Divine Constitution or not, that to the office of the administrative head, in, the, in, in case there is an, uh, any vacancy, then the additional administrative head will automatically become the administrative head on the, uh, to, fill, uh, to fill in the blank, uh, vacancy caused by the death of the administrative head. We had this legal problem when Dadi Prakashmani suddenly left her body. And then, you know, she died, Dadiji died and then you see for two days cremation did not take place. And then what happened? You know, this press or the media, they go on speculating. And the media in India, you see, they started speculating that if Dadi Prakashmani has left her body, then why Brahma Kumaris are not coming out with a resolution that who will be the next administrative head. And so one media reported also that in Brahma Kumaris there is that infighting going on, strong infighting, that who should become head and who should not become head. So that speculation uh, was part of the media propaganda. And then suddenly, Somebody telephoned me, said, look, I just listened to this particular channel from the television and please reply suitably to this particular argument that in Brahma Kumaris there is a big fight going on for selection of the administrative head. So when I heard this news on the TV that you see there is a big fighting going on in Brahma Kumaris, then I sent a rejoinder to them saying that it's not a fact, we don't have any fight here. We are not declaring who is going to be administrative head because we believe that unless and until cremation takes place, then till that time you see we do not think it officially that person is dead. So somebody asked me why you are not declaring because I said there are cases where people who have been taken, whose dead bodies have been taken to for cremation and suddenly they have come back from the cremation ground also. 
So it may be, it may be possible, therefore, in our case, what happened that Brahma Baba also left body on 18th of January, he became a Vyakta on 18th of January. And then Brahma Baba, uh, physical body's cremation took place on 21st, and then thereafter only uh, Sri Baba came down and officially declared Dadi Prakash Mani and Didi Man Mohini as the administrative and additional administrative head. So that tradition is already established and based on that thing we have decided that after the cremation we will have our meeting and in that we will declare uh, Dadi Janki because as per the constitution she has already become administrative head. In England you must be knowing that they don't say that, long live the king, king is dead. That is what they have declared. That means the post of king in England will never be vacant. The moment the old king dies, then before declaring that he is dead, they declare somebody else as the new king of England. And then they say, long live the king, king is dead. So like that, we said that you see, there is no such question of uh, who will be the new administrative head and all those things. We have already specified uh, a line of succession in case of our divine constitution that the additional administrative head will become administrative head. Only question that may be that who will be next additional administrative head. And there also we have, very, we have, very, we have got very common example that there were two joint administrative heads. And out of them, those two joint administrative heads, one become additional ad administrative head. So in th somebody else will be selected as new joint administrative head. So all these constitutional pro problems are the in connection with the succession. And succession is otherwise also a big question in many countries of the world. There are wars fought in India, for example, Jahangir. Jahangir, you see, he was a Muslim a Mughal king. And in order to become king of England, India, you see, he had to fight with his own son. And he had to kill his own son because his son declared himself to be the king of Eng India and not his father. And then Khusru was the son of Jahangir. So Jahangir had to kill his own son in order to him, uh, declare himself as the king of India. So this, like that, this fighting is going on and going on. Ramayana is full of this story also of successor because the king Dasrath wanted to declare Ram as the crown prince, prince. You know, there are two distinctions in case of prince, crown prince and ordinary prince. Crown prince means on the death of the king, their crown prince will become the king. So that is called as uh, crown prince, Yuvraj and Rajkumar in Hindi, or crown prince and ordinary prince. So, Dasarath wanted to declare his uh, son, eldest son, Ram, as the new, um, I mean, crown prince, so that if Dasarath by any chance dies, then his son, the Ram, will be declared as the new king of India. And then his th third wife, he had three queens and the third wife had one son Bharat. So she objected to that thing and she declared, she told her husband that she wants to have this particular promise from her husband that her son Bharat will be declared as the king of India. And for that purpose Ram should be asked to leave Ayodhya, that means this place where they were staying and go to, to the forest for 14 years and should return back after 14 years. So all these stories are there. In case of Mahabharata also, Pandavas and Kauravas, they had same problem. Father of Pandavas, Pandu, was the king, but then suddenly he died. And then who should become the king of India? And therefore all these things, stories are going on. So, uh, always a problem of succession, everywhere. And in uh, and divine family only there is a reservation. Because we have believed that, you see, uh, our divine sisters, they, are, they have been given this task of uh, uh, what we call as spreading this knowledge. They are the back, uh, brothers are backbone at the, at the 
back, but his sisters are in the forefront. And the work of giving knowledge and all those things is reserved for our divine sisters only. And they have done wonderfully well about this uh, task of spreading this divine knowledge. Today morning only there was one lady. She was very well educated and belonging to one, one of the, I uh, would say, elites of our VIP families of India. She was telling me that in Brahma Kumaris only there is all these sisters and others, they have done wonderful work. At present also, in India also there are a few saints in India. Swaminarayan, for example, many of you might have heard this name of Swaminarayan because so many temples they have constructed so at so many places. If you go to Delhi also, you will find they have constructed one temple, big temple in an area of more than 100 acres of land. Like that, so many, at more than this Pramukh Swami, who is the head of that institution, he has constructed more than 530 temples around the globe at various places in the world of the Swami Narayan. And there also there is that provision that women will not be allowed to sit on the same stage on which males are sitting. Male priests male priest are sitting on that stage, women will not be allowed to sit. They will be allowed to ask to sit somewhere else on this same stage. If the sisters are also there on the same stage, then those priests should observe fast for 24 hours for having committed the sin of sitting together on the same stage of that of the sisters. Still that is there, that is possible. And that lady said that when I met that chief of this Swami Narayan cult, you see, I argued with Swami Narayan, that means Pramukh Swami, that why these things are there, you see, in case of Brahma Kumaris, they do not have this distinction. And here you want to accept, you do not want to accept women uh, as your equal, why? And then that poor fellow said that this is what the founder of our cult has decided and therefore I have to follow that uh, tradition. So still as on today also, there are cults where you say they don't see the face of a woman also. They are not allowed to see them. They are not allowed to talk with them. If they talk, they, they must have a cloth curtain in between and then they should talk with them. So like that, they are being treated. Even in Hindu religion also, in Hindu religion and, and, and sannyas, and those who become sannyas is there, you see, there is a tradition uh, right from the time of, you must have read in this uh, Kalpatri, sannyas religion, sannyas branch, you see. Sankaracharya established the sannyas branch of the Hindu religion before about 1600 years. And right from that day till today, it was always a main dominated institution. At the top, there are four Sankaracharyas. Just below them, there are 64 Mahamandaleshwar. Out of this Mahamandaleshwar, if someone Someone, someone Sankaracharya dies, then someone is promoted to become the Sankaracharya. But for the last 1600 years, there was 100% reservation of position for women, uh, for men only. No women would be allowed to become a Sankaracharya or no women would be allowed to become uh, what we call as a Mahamandaleshwar. And then what happened that? We had a conference of religious leaders from Hindu religion. And in that conference, uh, top class religious leaders from Hindu religion came here, participated in this conference. And there in that conference, the general secretary of the, these religious heads or sadhus of India, saints of India, he declared that there is this defect in Hindu religion that although women constitutes normally, so to say, 50% of the total, total population, even then we have passed such rules and regulations which are discriminatory against the women of India. 
and Brahma Kumaris, they have cured this particular defect of Hindu religion. And they have given this work of teaching spiritual knowledge to women. Because till that time in India, in Hindu religion also, women were not allowed to be the teachers of spiritual knowledge. It was totally and totally reserved for men of India or the <coughs> saints of India. And then this yeah, General Secretary declared that we have to cure this particular defect of Hindu religion. And then they had their meeting. And slowly and slowly they have modified their tradition. And as on today, uh, they have modified and they have declared three women as the Mahamandaleshwari, that means uh, that tradition which was there in existence for last 1600 years, that tradition they have changed and three women of India, they have become Mahamandaleshwari or high priest in the field of the saints and seers of India. One of them was in Abu and in her lecture before us, she said that I have become Mahamandalishwari only, only and only because of Brahma Kumaris. For last 1600 years in India, no woman was allowed to become Mahamandalishwari. And I would, was not dreaming to be Mahamandalishwari, but unfortunately or fortunately, these saints of India came to Abu. They realized the potential ability of a woman for giving spiritual knowledge to the people. And they have modified their, this wrongful tradition of disallowing women to become Mahaman Leshwari. And in their senses, they have modified their rules and regulations. And therefore, I am one of those luckiest women of India that I have become Mahaman Leshwari. So this is the, so to say, effect of Brahma Kumaris on the political and spiritual scene of India. That apart, you know, in India, you see, Baba has always said that women, uh, first Radha, then Krishna, first Lakshmi, then Narayan, uh, then first Sita, and then Ram. So Baba has always said that in Satyuga and Gold, in Treta Yuga, the Golden Age and Silver Age, women will have a much more better role than what she has traditionally at present in the modern world. And uh, this is how you see in the Golden Age, in some of the scriptures also it is written that where women is worshipped, when women is given her due recognition, due place in this, due important place in the society, there these deities will be playing also, the deities also will be showering their blessings. So like that things are written in our scriptures of India also, but unfortunately uh, due to this Mughal, Mughal and other you see, emperors and others, because of their traditional uh, problems, women of India was neglected, so to say. Because what has happened that, you know, if you want to attract people to your own religion, then you have to compromise at certain level. And in first, think of those from the Hindu religion, the trunk of the tree, the different religions started coming up. And the first one was uh, Islam religion, established by Abraham. And then it was modified by Muhammad Paigambar, Muhammad the Prophet. There, in order to attract more people to Islam, they had to modify their uh, social structure. And they gave permission that a Muslim male can have four wives. You must be knowing these things. And they made these rules of divorce very simple. That three times if the male announces, I divorce, I divorce, I divorce, and that's the end of the marriage. So such liberal provisions were made to attract more and more people to become Muslim. In, uh, just I was telling you about Hyderabad. Hyderabad was formerly ruled by Muslim emperors, so to say, Muslim kings rather. And there, in order to attract more people to his state, he offered and he liberalized the provision of even Muslim religion also. He said that in his 
state. A Muslim can have five wives, not four wives, five wives. And therefore, so many Muslims from Arab and other Middle East countries, they used to go to Hyderabad and to have fifth wife in Hyderabad. Because if you go there and have fifth wife, then there will not be any religious uh, offense committed by them. A Muslim can have fifth wife in Hyderabad. So like that, there were so many questions in India. And therefore, it is, in some cases, the position of women was really pitiable. There are so many instances, I don't want to go into the detail of that thing. But when Baba started giving this knowledge, then what happened at that particular time? What was the social structure? That you must understand. And the role of Baba in empowering women of India, you see, of divine family, not only of this divine family, but of the common man also. Because three cases were there in the High Court of Karachi which were fought and as on today also they are the standard so to say uh, judgments which has liberalized Indian women. First judgment was regarding right to own property. You, you do not have these problems in your country but here in India there was a tradition, there was an understanding that Women does not have a right to own property. Whatever property is owned, that is owned by her husband only. And her husband is the master of the property. She cannot, he, I mean, she cannot own it and she cannot do anything with her own property. What happened, you know, Dadi Bholi, those who are coming since last more than eight, eight ten years, you see, might be knowing the Dadi Bholi. I, I don't know how many of you know Dadi Bholi. She was in charge of our kitchen. She was a, what we call, you used to call Annapurna, uh, in charge of kitchen. She was supplying food and in charge of cooking and all those things. How many of you, please raise your hands. So this Dadi Bholi's case was there, you see. <coughs> and she has a daughter, you see. Her daughter's name is Meera. If you go to Pandav Bhavan, uh, talk to the sister Meera and you will understand. Uh, or you can ask her question about her mother also. <coughs> so Dadi Bholi came and surrendered to Baba. She surrendered to Baba with her own jewellery. She had two types of jewelries. One given by her husband. And the second type of jewellery, which one which was given to her by her own parents. Try to understand the difference between two varieties of ownership of jewellery. One jewellery given by Dadi Bholi's husband. You have followed this question. And the other one was the jewellery own uh, or given to her by her own parents at the time of marriage and we in India there is a tradition the parents give some jewellery something uh, can cash or kind to their daughter so she had received this jewellery from her husband uh, from her parents also so she brought Dadi Bholi brought her own jewellery that means her own jewellery given to her by her parents. She left jewellery given to her by her husband, uh, with the family of her husband. But she came here with the jewellery of her parents. And her father, husband filed a case that, okay, if you want to go and become Brahma Gumari, go, but give us back jewellery that you have taken uh, which you had received from your parents. That is my property, not your property. You have followed this question. Once again I will repeat, her husband filed a case declaring that in that case that you may become Brahma Kumari, I don't mind. But the jewellery which you have received from your parents, it is not your property, it is 
my property and therefore you must give it to me. You can take your daughter, you, take, you can take Meera with you, but you cannot take your jewellery huh, which you have received by way of gift from your parents. That is my property. Because his claim was that the women was not entitled to own property. Whatever property that is owned in the name of a woman, that will be the property of the husband only. That was the traditional belief. And based on that traditional belief, the husband of Dadi Bholi filed a case in High Court of Karachi. It was part of Bombay High Court. And it was there the question came up. And the High Court decided that no, women has right to own property. Property given to her by her own parents from her own maternal side or paternal side, that is her property. She has a right to own her own property. You have followed this question, this legal question. And as on today also, that judgment is being followed and women has right to own their own property, property given to them um, at the time of marriage by her parents. And on that, husband has no right. So this first fundamental right that was given, uh, that was recognized by the courts of India was based on Baba's knowledge in case of this Dadi Bholi that women has right to own their property. That was the first, very first important milestone in the lives of the women of India because till that time a wife also was to, supposed to be the, the property of their family, uh, uh, husband's family or husband's property. A second case, uh, some, uh, another case was there where you see husband uh, uh, said that she is my wife, my right, I have a right, uh, conjugal rights. You know certain rights are there based on marriage and those rights are also declared uh, 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 um, by the courts, uh, by the traditions also. Those rights are rights of conjugal rights, a right to, uh, and, and therefore the second case was against this right that you see um, Baba had declared this, uh, the sisters had given this woe of chastity that we will remain pure, we will live and lead a pure life. The males of India or the, of that community, of Sindhi communities or the Karachi and Hyderabad community declared that sorry, they do not have this right. Uh, they, and we are the husbands, we, are, we have got these conjugal rights and we have, can establish that thing that a woman is not the master of her own body. A woman is not a master of her own wishes. She has to surrender to the wishes and to the whims of her husband. That was the traditional belief and therefore uh, the husband filed this case against this sister that she cannot, she has to surrender her right, she has to observe and she cannot observe purity and all those things. A right to observe purity was not till that time recognized for a woman, or for a married woman. You can understand the difficulties of women uh, in those days that you have to become slaves, so to say, of their husbands. You have to satisfy their desires and all those things were there, you see. And for the first time, this question came up before the High Court of Karachi. And in the Karachi High Court it was declared, and the husband declared and filed the case that, yes, she is my wife, she has to obey me and I have a right, I have the right to enjoy everything of her body and her wishes and everything. She has to be my obedient wife only. You have followed this question, this second important question. And the High Court said nothing doing. She is the master of her own body. She is the master of her own wishes and desires and all those things. You cannot and cannot force her uh, to surrender yourself uh, to your desires and all those things. She is the master of your, her body. Now only in India, rape has been uh, redefined that sex with the women without her consent 
uh, in case of even if with your own wife is a rape that is the new addition into the uh, uh, indian penal code of india Ra rape for the first time it is not still there in many countries of the world that rape means uh, having sexual relationship with your own wife without her consent is not treated in many countries of the world as a rape but in india government of india has based on these judgments other things is they have passed this law that rape means that is against the desire of the wife you cannot have sexual relationship with your own wife also that is also rape and if you do it if you indulge in it you are punishable so this all this started in india because of this judgment you see that judgment declared that yes she has a right to own her own body right to have her own desires and wishes and all those things she is the master of her body you have followed this question important question which has been decided in favor of women of india in karachi and that is still being followed and as and today and then the government modified the law and rape in india has been modified which is still not modified in many countries of the world and and, and sexual offense by husband against the desire of the wife is not treated as rape in many countries of the world more than 60 to 70 60 to 70% of the countries are there still there in that those countries also women is not the master of her own body you may not agree this thing but it's a legal fact but in india you see because of baba and because of the government of india following baba so to say has declared and women is the master of her own body and if she wants to observe purity she has right to become pure and live a pure celibate life it's a very important uh, milestone in the uh, life of the women of india i don't know whether you are all interested in this legal battle i don't know whether it is also it sounds interesting for you or not but because i am from the field of law also and i know that you see what uh, positive gains the women of india have received from or the benefit which the women of india they have received from the uh, so to say advent or from the incarnation of god in this in country and the sindh was the worst community or country uh, that where women were treated as the worst and the third judgment very important judgment that women had right to leave family also if a husband if a male wants to become in order to have self Uh, purification and self empowerment and all those things if a male wants to become sanyasi and leave his home leave his family and all those things then he was entitled to leave his family you cannot control a, a male hindu male in india that was the traditional belief and then what happened that Ladi Pushpa Shanta and many other sisters, they were married. They had their own children and all those things. And then they left their husbands and they came here. They left their families. And these families, that means these males of uh, Sindhi community, they filed case that oh, our wives have left us and our children at home. That they cannot do it. They have to come back. they have to come back take care of the family they have to take care of their husbands they have to take care of their children they have no right to renounce their families they have no right to renounce their family life or their children and all those things they have no right for self emancipation or self purification uh, by leaving their families it's a very important right 
and it was very well contested in the court. All the males on one side saying that, yes, this is our right, our wives must come back and take care of our children. After all, they are also partly responsible for the family and therefore they must sustain and maintain the family. And fortunately, so to say, the courts of India decided in favor of our this divine sisters and said that if a human, a male, a Hindu male had right to renounce his family life, to renounce his family duties, to renounce his responsibilities and all those things, to take care of his family, his children and all those things, for uh, self-purification and self-emancipation and all those things. Then the court said that, yes, a Hindu woman is also equally have, has the right to renounce her family and to do uh, practice spiritual laws and all those things in order to have self-purification and all those things. And the courts safeguarded uh, this position of women. So these three important judgments of the Hindu family, in, in case of Hindu culture and society and all those things, you see, they are the three, uh, I would say to say, important judgments in case, the legal judgments huh, or the legal protection which was recognized by the courts of India due to Brahma Kumaris. First, right to own property. Second, conjugal rights also, that right to have and to observe purity. And third, to leave your own family and all those things in order to have self-purification and self-upliftment also. So these three rights were recognized. And as on today also, it is still there, you see. And it is, it is being practiced. Now it is accepted. Now if somebody leaves her family, then people do not go to the court. They know that, you see, judgments are against us. Law is against us. Police is away. Police will not help us. So, what I wanted to say is that, you see, look, Baba, you see, and the benefits which, because of which I mean, the Hindu family, Hindu society, or Hindu, Hindu women got because of Baba. Many of them may not become Brahma Kumari. They may not recognize Baba. But <coughs> this way, three rights which have been conferred on them by the courts of India, on account of judgments of the courts of India, on account of actions of Hindu males against Hindu women uh, who had joined Om Manli. You know, in those days we were known as Om Manli. And therefore, when these sisters and others, they had joined Om Manli. So, these three rights, right to own property, that was the first preliminary right. Second right, right of observing purity. And third, that you can write, you can have your own method of living. You can leave your family, you can leave your children, others also. If the husbands have right, then women also has equal right. And these three rights were recognized, so to say, by courts of India. So the, now only this question of reservation and voting and all those things, and they think that uh, the uh, spiritual dimension or the spiritual upliftment of women of India will be by reserving certain seats in the parliament of India, where thereby, you see, uh, the plight of women will be improved. That is the modern day's concept. But Baba, right from 37, all those things happened between 1937 and 1940. Think of the society, not of 2010, because now it, it, India also has become an open society because of coming into contact with the Western world and all those things. The world has become a small globe and therefore in, there are so many influences. Otherwise, think of earlier days. And, and, and in those earlier days, you see, I mean, to go overseas was supposed to be a crime. I give you two examples. One of Mahatma Gandhi. I don't know whether you have heard the name of Mahatma Gandhi. 
I hope you have heard the name of Mahatma Gandhi. We, uh, we, uh, we call him as father of this nation because he was the leader, so to say, and uh, in our fight against um, imperialism, so to say, uh, he was the leader because of which India got independence from British rule. Take example of Mahatma Gandhi and another example of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, founder of Pakistan. I hope you have heard the name of Pakistan. Is there anybody who has not heard the name of Pakistan? You all have heard the name of Pakistan. So examples of the lives of Mahatma Gandhi and the example of the life of Muhammad Ali Jina. Mahatma Gandhi, he was the son of the um, Prime Minister, so to say, uh, of one princely state of India. If you go to Saurashtra, uh, it means western side of Gujarat, but beyond Gujarat, um, Andabad, do you, if you go to Porbandar, his father was the... Uh, uh, it was a small state and his father was the uh, prime minister, so to say, of that particular state. And he promoted Mahatma Gandhi for studies uh, and uh, to, uh, from UK and become bar at law barrister. Barrister, bar at law from England. He went to England, became barrister and came back. When he came back, his community said that, oh, you have crossed the ocean. You have crossed the ocean, you have committed a sin. You have committed a sin and therefore you must observe certain punishment. Remember those days, you see, when he is returning back from England, at the age of 23 or 24, he came back from England after studying in England for more than four or five years and became barrister and was, he started practicing, practice in India. Afterwards, he went to South Africa. He stayed there for 35 years, came back and then joined Indian politics and then helped us, all the Indian politicians. So when he came back, his community leaders said nothing doing. You have to observe certain principles. You must come to Rajkot. Rajkot is in the central in, in uh, Saurashtra. That means be about 200 kilometers from Ahmedabad. You must, you must come there. You must observe certain religious practices. You must observe, uh, yeah, do what we call as Yagya Tapasriya, Yagya, and observe certain principles. You must shave your... Uh, Hair, you know, no hair on the head, you see. So, you must have that thing and then you must observe fasting for three days and all those things and you must observe these sacrificial ceremonies and thereby purify yourself. Otherwise, we will not treat you as member of our community. You will, have, you will be declared as Muslim. Fortunately, or unfortunately, whatever you call it, he agreed. He was, not that, he was not that stubborn in his principles. And he agreed that, okay, if you think that I have committed crime, I have committed a sin by going to England and all those things, okay, I will observe whatever punishment you want me to give. And I will observe that thing. But please treat me as Hindu only. Why? Because Mahatma Gandhi had four sons. Mahatma Gandhi was the father of four sons. And you know, you see, in, in one of the duties of parents of India is to get their sons married or to get their daughters married. It's one of the constitutional, so to say, religious practice of India, of all the parents, to get their children married. And if 
uh, Mahatma Gandhi had been declared as Muslim, then his four sons will not get a girl from their community. Think of those days. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi must be, you see, if he had uh, survived, he, he died in 1950 on account of shooting by one another gentleman. He died in 1950 at the age of 78 or so. Uh, add 78 and uh, 1950, so to 60 years. So 78 plus 60 years. He must be 138 uh, or so at present. So think of those uh, days when he was just a boy, young boy of 25, 26, father of four sons. Because he had an early marriage, marriage at the age of 12 or 13, so to say. And because of that, he remained Hindu. As against that, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Muslim Pakistan, that means Pakistan, his grandfather was Hindu. Grandfather of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Premji Bhai, was, that was his name, Premji. He was Hindu. And he was working as an accountant, you know, accountant, maintaining accounts of a Muslim businessman who was dealing in trading, in, was dealing in fishes, you know, in, in, in this part of Saurashtra, there the fishes are very, very, very tasty, so to say, those who eat non-veg food. I don't know, many of you might have eaten also non-veg food. And these fishes uh, from Saurashtra, that is Verava, Somnath and other places, they are still exported to Japan. So, he was working uh, with a, a Muslim uh, businessman who was dealing in export of fishes. And what happened? That that owner of that businessman, that Muslim businessman, who was dealing in fishes, died on account of some sickness. His children were young. His children were young. And he, he had this grandfather of Muhammad Ali Jina uh, as his accountant. So he, he asked his accountant to take care of his business and to take care of his family till his children attain the age of majority and accept the responsibility of running their business. You have followed this question. Muhammad Ali Jinnah's grandfather was Hindu, accountant only. He was not a dealer in fishes. He was just maintaining accounts of a person who was dealing in fishes. But because of his boss, uh, on his deathbed, took a promise from him that he will not uh, desert his family, he will not renounce his family, that means his Muslim family. He will take care of his children as a guardian, will take care of his business, and as and when his children become old enough to take care of their business, Till that time he will manage the family and manage the business. So he was just a caretaker of the business, of fishes, exporting fishes. And to that his community took objection. That because you are participating in a business of fishes, and therefore, you are a Muslim, you are not Hindu. We declare you uh, as out of our community, out of our caste. That fellow pleaded guilty. He said, yes, I am prepared to observe punishment, whatever punishment you want to give to me. I am not the owner, I am just the caretaker of my boss. Because on his deathbed, he took that promise from me that I will not desert, I will not renounce 
his family business and his children also. Children will be taken care till they become old enough to take care of their business. But his community was, uh, so to say, um, having tough time. That means his grandfather of um, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah had tough time with his community and his community said, nothing doing. You cannot, we cannot compromise with you. You are a Muslim. And therefore he was declared outclass, out of the community. His father, his grandfather had four sons. In order to get his four sons married, he had to adopt Islam religion. And he, when he adopted Islam religion, his um, son, Jina, became Muslim. And, and then that Jina had a son, Muhammad Ali. Jina uh, by Muhammad Ali means who became the... He was, uh, he was also from ba Barrister Barrett Law from England. And he was a very re well-renowned, so to say, lawyer of Bombay. And he entered into politics with a vengeance against Hindus that my grandfather had not committed any crime, but why my grandfather was declared as out of the community? Why he was thrown out from the community? I will teach the lesson of the people of India. And therefore, he joined British rules, rulers and uh, divided India and we have Pakistan. And therefore, there is a book on this subject that if, if history does not recognize two words, if and but, history does not recognize two words, if and but, but by chance, if history has recognized this word, if, and if the community of the grandfather of Muhammad Ali Jina has accepted the punishment which he accepted to observe, and if Muhammad Ali Jina's grandfather had remained Hindu, Pakistan may not have come into existence. Think of the rigidity of the social practices of those days, this rigidity. And the other way around, if the community of Mahatma Gandhi had not accepted and had not become flexible and had rigidly observed uh, religious principles against Mahatma Gandhi, and if Mahatma Gandhi had become Muslim, then what would have been the future of India? It's a question, it's a debatable question. I'm just asking you to observe the, uh, these two rigid principles, that in these uh, rigid principles of communities of India, think of the women's emancipation uh, caused by Baba. You have followed? You don't think of 2010, of emancipation of women of 2010, but think of emancipation of 1936-37 or prior to that also when Mahatma Gandhi, you see, was when I, I, I have just told you that if Mahatma Gandhi had been alive today, he would have been 138 years. He returned back from England at the age of 25 or 26 or whatever it may be. So, just 110 years be behind. Uh, go back into the history, 110 years, the rigid communities of India rigid observation of rules and regulations uh, of the caste and communities. It was always there. I have got a book about this guilt system in England and how rigid guilt system and, and guilt communities of England were there. I have got Radni Pame Dutt's book on this subject. It was a rigid community, rigidly followed uh, religious practices everywhere. England was not an exception to the thing. Everywhere laws were rigid, absolutely rigid. You cannot go out of your own community. You cannot go against the ch desires of the chief of your community and all those things were there. Uh, compare, uh, uh, compare that situation 
and in those situ- compare that situation in that situation baba uh, said nothing doing i want to give this knowledge through and through the medium of sisters we have got now 15000 sisters so to say those who are fully dedicated to the cause of spiritual upliftment of the people of the world it says biggest spiritual army so to say that we are owning we are having uh, which has been generated so to say by baba this 15000 sisters we are maintaining 7800 or 8000 centers in 132 countries look the liberated women of india what miracle uh, what wonderful work that they have done most of you also must have received this knowledge through these sisters from india or through india am i right so this uh, this uh, liberated women of india uh, liberated the sindhi women of india you see and then their role and then there what they have done in india you see till 52 and 52 they were uh, in a close community and then in 52 baba asked them to go out to the world and then give this knowledge to the world i am also the product of uh, this divine sisters giving knowledge to my mother and then others also most of you also must have received this divine knowledge with from the help or through the help of the sisters of india i mean but that means look the spiritual upliftment that we got from these liberated women of india i hope you will appreciate this thing the role of brahma baba and role of shri baba in uh, establishing uh, this new world order through the and with the help of these women of india the liberated women of india so this is the true uh, immense uh, liberation of women of india you see or whole the entire world so to say will be liberated uh, because of the divine uh, presence of this divine sisters and the divine knowledge that we received of shri baba through these sisters so it's a great challenge and at that time in 1936 37 to observe and to accept the role of women at that time you say uh, sadhu vaswani and others is the saints of india you say at that time they had this picketing outside our premises oh nothing doing you cannot go there you cannot go this they do, do all those things you see <coughs> they had influence also the uh, chief minister of the pakistan also uh, at that time it was sindh and then they uh, uh, forced something uh, some uh, 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 prohibition on the public activity of the om manli and all those things so in those rigid days of rigid laws and regulations of the hindu male or of the male society of india male dominated society of india um, and at that time uh, baba brahma baba uh, playing the uh, pioneering role of giving this knowledge to the world through this divine sisters of india think of those things uh, in 19 in 2010 you are all sitting here in a comfortable atmosphere but do think of 1936 37 people against brahma kumaris against om manli male dominated society and this male dominated society against working against the institution against um, the principles and practices of brahma kumaris all those things were there you see so think of those <laughs> with this background and then you will understand the real significance of advent of shri baba on this earth drama or on the world drama it is very simple and very easy to judge all those things in 2010 but if imagine yourself in 1936 37 38 you are not uh, you are not recognized by the hindu males 
Hindu saints and all those seers and others of India that, oh yes, women cannot do these things, women cannot become preachers, women cannot uh, give spiritual knowledge. All these rules were there, rigid rules were there. And in this background of these rigid rules, I gave you example of Mahatma Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. <coughs> Think of those days uh, against these rigid principles, rigid practices and all those things, you see, where the government could not do anything. In those cases, uh, government of India, you see, and um, I mean, the, the Brahma Baba and the society of Hyderabad and Sindhis of Hyderabad ex took these giant steps, so to say, of recognizing women as torch bearers of this divine knowledge and spread this divine knowledge. Really, I mean, in that case context, you will uh, understand Baba's divine principles and practices. It's not merely theory, in theory, divine principles, but importance is also of divine practices that Baba, you see, uh, withstood all the uh, pressures from various people. Brahma Baba was sufficiently rich. Otherwise, if he was not, if he had not been monetarily rich, and if he had to depend on the donation of the people, then what would have happened? He would have been forced to accept these rigid rules and regulations of the society. But think of Baba, huh? and then you will realize the importance of Baba in this divine family and in establishing this divine family of Brahma Kumaris. I hope uh, now you will have that better understanding of role. Think of the Dadi Prakashmani, think of Dadi Janaki, think of Didi Manmohini and all these divine sisters. So to say, as Dadi Janaki used to say yesterday for yesterday, ancestors. These ancestors have played a very, very, very important role. And then and that is being carried forward by our sister Mohini, sister Jayanti, Dadi Janaki and Dadi Ratan Mohini and others. Sorry, I forgot to switch it off. So, sorry for the, I don't know whether I have uh, given you the real material of thinking on this subject of emancipation or empowerment of women of India, you see, um, by B Baba, the real role played by Baba and the real work that is being still done by divine sisters of this Brahma Kumaris divine family. And think and appreciate this work from that particular angle. Om Shanti. Just one minute I wanted to add that you see emancipation or empowerment of women does not mean giving them right to become, uh, to have 34 percent seats in the parliament of India. That is not real emancipation, empowerment of women. But the work that Baba has done, that is the real thing which has helped in liberating, so to say, women of India. <coughs> but unfortunately, Government of India does not recognize these things. They said just give 34% reserve in the Parliament of India. Let us see what happens. Om Shanti. Thank you, Ramesh Bhai, for the wonderful things you have said. But then I'm wondering if anybody of you have any questions. Would you like to ask any question? You can raise your hand. Anyone? Yes, you have a question? Okay, say. Oh, Ramesh Bhai, they would like to know how you came to Baba. <laughs> oh, it's a big, Just in brief. Big lengthy question, but because of my mother. My mother came to know this knowledge in 52. In 1952, 
our divine sisters came to Bombay from Abu because they came to India. That means Abu in 1950, in December 50, and in May 52, they came to Bombay. And within first fortnight of their visit to Bombay, my mother came into contact. And through my mother, we came to, into this divine family of Brahma Kumaris. And also, how Ramesh Bhai, you can just share how, because of his mother, how he, his mother wanted Baba to come to Bombay, but there was some, they should have been somebody who could really officially invite Baba to Bombay. So his mother told him, because he was a lawyer, he was a professor, and he had a, a big, you know, income tax practice. So she told him, please, you invite Baba. At that time, he was not in Gyan that much. He was actually practicing or going to another place where he learned all the scriptures. Just soul please, soul please, soul. if you could say that, Ramesh Bhai, they'll be very happy. Yes, I have that distinction of playing the role of host for Baba for four and a half months. Many of you may not have seen even Baba also. How many of you have seen Brahma Baba in, their, in his corporeal form? No one, they're all ba born after. Only one sister is raising their hand. <laughs> all double foreigners are born after Baba became a Viet. <laughs> yes, you are the product of our first trip, 1971. We six musketeers, so to say. Uh, two brothers and four sisters left India in 71. We were told by Baba to establish one center on the east and one center in the west. And this is how it started. And also how Mama stayed in your house. Just share a few things, Ramesh Bhai, they'll be happy. Ah, yes, that's also a real blessing. Mama stayed with us for 18 months. What, whatever we are today, is the, we are the product of Mama's guidance and knowledge. That daily we used to get Daily at night time we used to take dinner with Mama. For 18 months, I think of our good fortune of taking dinner with Mama. And today if you have any, by any chance, if you get chance to see, take lunch or dinner with Dadi Janaki, you will think, oh, it's really a good, good, uh, uh, good blessing. I think of my fortune, so to say. For 18 months, I was the host, and for 18 months, it's because lunchtime, I had my office and all those things. But dinner time, we were together, sitting together, eating together, talking together. A few weeks ago, you must have heard Ramesh Bhai and Usha Ben's name in Baba's Murli. Did you hear, did you read? In which Baba said that, uh, those exact words, that how they are celibate from birth, how uh, though they are they married, but then they lived a celibate life, and uh, and they know that they have to become Lakshmi Narayan, you know. So the purity is in them right from the beginning. So this also was this also was a wonderful thing that how they were going to another place where they learned all the scriptures and all, but then when they came to Baba, then how Baba attracted them and they got married and then uh, Baba told them to come to Madhuban for their first honeymoon. <laughs> so, see, Ramesh Bhai, if you could share that in 1960, how you came to Madhuban. And I was the fortunate one to be in that group, to come to Madhuban with, with Ramesh Bhai and Usha Ben in 1960. She was so just a school girl. <laughs> so 50 years we, ago. We have seen Brahma's sister with the school uniform and all those things. <laughs> and she was carrying her school bag and uh, books and all those things. Just Ramesh, if so you could you share. So you have seen for ben as a big, big, big huh? qualified sister. We have seen her as a young, you see. You know, a girl sister. going to school, coming to the center in a school uniform and then going to school. In, that's how Ramesh Bhai saw me. And when I was studying, I was in college, every time he would meet me and say, Shilubhan, for how long are you going to study? Do you want to study up to destruction? 
I said, no, 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 I'll finish my studies soon. <laughs> but Ramesh, by just a few words of how Baba and Mama gave you so much love. Can I tell you one story about this sister? Shilu. <laughs> <laughs> Ramesh, you Bhai time, loves to tell that story. If you have time, I can <laughs> yeah, tell you one. That is five minutes. Five minutes, okay. What happened that, you see, in Bombay there is one institute, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. They do it. And they, are, they have got renowned scientists also. And uh, the chief of uh, that institution was known to me. I was always in, I, inviting him to come to our center at that time. It was in Waterloo Mansion, just opposite Regal Cinema in Bombay. Many of you might, be, might have heard about Waterloo Mansion. So on one fine mo evening, you see, he agreed to come to Waterloo Mansion center. And I told Dadi Nima Shanta, you know Dadi Nima Shanta, daughter of Brahma Baba, she was our center in charge. So I had informed her in advance that I am coming there in the evening, please spare your time to talk with this gentleman. He is very renowned scientist, he is also having uh, the qualification of being given the title of Padma Shri, one of those top owners of India, you see. So, when I came to center in the company of that chief of this Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, I asked him to sit in the classroom and then went to meet Dadi Nimo Shanta and invite Dadi Nimo Shanta to, to meet that gentleman. And then Dadi said, oh, sorry, Ramesh, I am busy, I have got this guest, I cannot come and sit with you. You only talk with him. I said, if I had to talk with him, then I would have talked with him in his institute only. Suddenly, sister came from our school. The school uniform and all those things. And Dadi Nimasanda said, you take this sister and she will give knowledge to that gentleman. So, I had my own doubts. <laughs> to, to, be tell, to tell you very frankly, the, how this sister will be able to convince uh, this uh, gentleman, you see. So, anyhow, I accepted Baba and Rama and Dadi and said, okay. So, I took uh, Sister Shilu in front of that gentleman, uh, chief of one of the big, biggest uh, institu uh, research institution of India. And that gentleman asked him, what are you doing? And she said that I am studying in school. I think she was in this 10th standard. And the, uh, means pre-metric, means in the schools only. I remember that person, he had more than 10 degrees at the end of his name. And he was so, so much well qualified. And here he was sitting in front of his sister, was just studying in 10th standard of, uh, this, of the schools of India. But then uh, he had to observe, because after all he was our guest, so he had to observe principles of the host. He could not do anything. And Sister Silu asked him his name. What is your name? <laughs> he, she can tell, narrate you all these stories. And that fellow said, I am Professor Rao. So he said that, no, 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 <laughs> that is not your name. And all those things, <laughs> it went on for 20 minutes. And then she said that your name is, you are a soul, Saligram as we call it here. In, and therefore, you are not a Rao. He said, okay. Then sister asked the second question, what is the name of your father? <laughs> and that gentleman gave the name of his father. <laughs> and then he, uh, sister Silu said, no, no, that is not the name of your father. <laughs> and that fellow said, that, that is what my, father, my mother said, that he is your father. <laughs> That poor gentleman was having a big dilemma <laughs> that who is his father. <laughs> then she gave that knowledge that, oh, yes, that is the name of the father of your body, but the father of your soul, and then Shiva Baba. <laughs> and then for 20 minutes she gave uh, knowledge about Shiva Baba. <laughs> and then the third question she asked, from where have you come? And that fellow said, sorry, sister, I don't know anything. <laughs> 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 
you tell me from where i have come he gave up complete surrender of a person with more than 10 degrees <laughs> at the end of his name <laughs> to a, in front of a sister who was just studying in the 10th class that was the beauty of baba's knowledge <laughs> So when afterwards you see, when I drove him back to his institution, you see, I asked him, "Om Shanti." Huh? Here on, on our return journey, I asked him about his experience. He said that in three questions, your sister shattered my ego. <laughs> I was thinking I am a very well-read person, but I could not answer all her three questions. <laughs> so that was the beauty of uh, Sri Baba's knowledge, or so to say, Sri, what Sister uh, discussed with him.